Welcome to the Lake Erie Regional Great Program Coffee Pot Meeting virtually. Appreciate you all being here. We do have a special guest speaker today, Dr. Greg Loeb, who is an entomology professor at Cornell University working on um, specialty crops is fruits and grapes. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I have well, actually made you a co-host, and I know that you're a little bit pressed for time today. I do appreciate you taking time out of your very busy schedule to share with us. Yeah, so, I'm, I'm not the only one who's pressed for time, but so I'm happy to join you. <laughs> Thank you. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Gray Blum to our Coffee Pot series. He is the grape and small fruit specialty crop entomologist at Cornell University, and I'll let him do a better job of introducing himself than I can. Okay. Thank you for being here, Greg. No you problem. are more than willing to share your screen right now if you want to start with that. All right. So hi, everyone. And um, it looks like people are joining from different places. I, I don't know if you're on your phones or whatever. So I don't know how well the, the slides will come through, but uh, we'll do our best. Um, I kind of viewed this as you know, an opportunity to uh, provide an update on some of the, the research we're doing in grapes and also answer questions. Uh, uh, Jennifer did say that uh, there was some interest in getting, getting an update on grape berry moth. So I, I probably will dedicate most of my time talking about that. You know, I know we are seeing or are experiencing more kind of late season grape berry moth. Uh, injury, and I want to address that at least to some extent. And I'm really also interested in folks' comments and discussions. So I, I hope I can figure out a way to kind of get some discussion going because I'm also interested to see what you guys are or hear about what you guys are seeing either last year. Um, and of course, I'm interested in any observations you have for this this season. Any kind of concerns you have, I can try to address uh, if possible. But let me kind of go through the slides, but if you want to interrupt, uh, I, I'm fine with that. And so just kind of say, hold on a second, and we'll, we'll go there. So if you can go to the next slide, uh, Jennifer, I'll uh, just sure. try to give you my outline for what I kind of prepared. Um, so I wanted to do a, and you may have had one of these recently, but I wanted to at least give you a quick update on the uh, spotted lanternfly, something on everybody's mind. Like I said, I'll focus in on great berry moth, probably spend the most time on that. And then um, I will uh, just give you a, a really a little bit of an outline of some of the research projects we're doing that may or may not kind of relate to some of the issues you might be having. Um, and then I'll finish with a quick kind of update on changes to insecticides and miticides, which I did include in that uh, uh, kind of spring update for entomology, but I'll review those a bit, see if there's any questions there as well. Okay, next slide. Okay, spotted lanternfly. So it's certainly in the news more and more. You guys, I assume everybody in Western New York and in, in Western Pennsylvania, Lake Erie area is kind of aware of this. Um, Flor Acevedo may have, I don't know, may have been uh, talking to you about this as well. Um, but just kind of give you an update where things stand uh, up to the end of last season when the adults kind of petered out, people were finding egg masses, et cetera, and you know, kind of where things are heading. Um, so spotted lanternfly, as you probably very well, this invasive species that showed up in Pennsylvania, it's this pretty big plant hopper. It's a sucking insect, it uses sucking mouth parts, and it feeds on a number of different plants. Uh, Tree of Heaven is the one, the introduced plant from Asia, which is where this guy comes from is maybe one of his preferred, but it feeds on other woody plants. Um, quite a few hosts actually. It, in the terms of crops though, it particularly likes and or can damage grapes. And we're certainly seeing that in Pennsylvania in that core area of where it really got going. Um, and sort of a concern maybe particularly for grape growers. So this is just a picture of the adult, very colorful adult uh, on the upper left. Uh, a very late in star nymph on the bottom left, and then a, a picture of adult kind of with its wings folded and an egg mass, this kind of coated group of eggs that they lay on this kind of vertical surfaces, um, all sorts of things they put them on that uh, are typically the overwintering stage that then hatch out in the spring about now and kind of go through this one year life cycle 
where adults really don't show up in our area until later August, and then they're busy uh, mating and laying eggs late into the fall and until they die out. Okay, next next slide. So here's a, a pretty recent update on the, the distribution of spotted lanternfly. And you can see in that Berks County, Pennsylvania, where it kind of got going, it's starting to, it's, it is spreading out. So the blue marks where there's uh, active infestation present, um, maybe eradication is trying to go on, but we found actually adults and eggs and nymphs in those, these areas in blue. You see it's centered in Pennsylvania, but now we're seeing that uh, infestations occurring in New Jersey, uh, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia, Connecticut, now recently in Ohio, uh, a little bit in West Virginia, and in the southern part of New York State, there have some pretty major infestations on Staten Island. Uh, they've shown up a little bit in some of the uh, boroughs of New York City. In terms of more upstate New York, uh, so far nothing except Last year, a population that was laying eggs was discovered near Ithaca, uh, uh, Cornell campus actually, or in the city below the campus where there was a parking lot, had uh, I think Tree of Heaven trees in that parking lot, which is often the case for Tree of Heaven. And they got a, a population discovered there. Um, that was late in the season last year. They started eradication uh, process, this is a, um, DEC and Ag and Markets kind of working together uh, in various aspects of management in New York. Um, they started eradications this spring, taking out trees. Um, so far, I haven't gotten an update. Uh, well, we'll know a little bit later uh, this spring or summer whether, you know, if there's fresh infestations. The pattern in, in Ithaca is, is, is a common one as they're spreading out. They seem to get connected on transportation routes, the egg masses or, or even adults or hitchhikers. They get transported along transportation routes. They might show up in a parking lot, in a recreation area, a parking lot, and in this case, uh, I think it was apartment complex. Um, they, if they find you know, suitable hosts, they can start a colony on that. And that's kind of where we see these things showing up. Uh, there's also some evidence that they're moving along rail lines. Um, they're not particularly strong flyers, but they will, they will fly, especially before they become reproductive and kind of move from, from host to host. Uh, or from a wooded forest into a, a place like a vineyard. Okay, so I think the take home message on this map and maybe my, maybe my take home message is this, this thing is slowly spreading out in New York and, uh, and in the Lake Erie region. We don't know about it as a significant pest, but that's sort of potentially in our future. Next slide. I don't know if there are any, uh, any questions at this point. Just feel free to fire. Not that I've seen in the chat box, but if you okay. do have some, please let us know. Okay, thanks. So, you know, in, in, a, in anticipation of spotted lanternfly kind of spreading out of that cent central area of an uh, original infestation, uh, we are kind of looking at what are the insecticides that would be effective in controlling it in grapes. And this is really based on a lot of work that's been done in, in uh, Pennsylvania by uh, Dave Benninger and Heather Leach and, and others. So I, I want to acknowledge the, the excellent work that they've been doing on all aspects, really, that whole group and all aspects of uh, spotted, la spotted lanternfly biology and management. But what, what they've shown is that uh, spotted lanternfly is susceptible either as the nymphal, the immature stage or adult stage to quite a few insecticides. And here are the ones that are uh, approved for use on grapes, either through, well, I think they're all through 2EE in New York, or they are labeled on grapes if we're talking about Pennsylvania. And you can kind of go across this list. I'm not gonna uh, go over it uh, too, too uh, thoroughly, just to note that there are a number of different compounds that we know of and have experience using in grapes that show efficacy against these things. So you might, might ask, and I've asked, well, boy, how do we see pictures of vineyards, literally vines dying due to the, the damage from these things when we have these effective tools? And I think the answer is what happens in areas where the densities are very high is they just keep flowing in from the woods and a vineyard can kind of get overwhelmed, even though you can spray, you can knock them back, but they, 
you know, at high densities are kind of hard to get a handle on. So that's what you really, we're really kind of concerned about is hopefully we won't see those kind of high densities in other areas, but uh, that's, that's when you start seeing economic damage. I don't think we have a specific threshold well developed, but you know, it does take several of these insects to cause economic damage. And you get that when you get these high populations building up, particularly in, in the woodlots and then kind of moving into the vineyard. We're not there in New York or in, as far as I know, in your area, Lake Erie, uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, but that's something that we're kind of looking, trying to anticipate and prepare for. Um, and at the same time, there's a lot of work going on on spotted lanternfly biology and alternative management um, that we can then bring in to help. So, for example, they're exploring areas of origin for spotted lanternfly for parasitoids that could be released. That takes a while, but that would be an idea. So they have some natural biological control going on in the environment um, that can help reduce the overall populations that could come into the vineyard and cause problems. There's also work going on with uh, fungal pathogens of spotted lanternfly that show some potential efficacy um, that we might be able to spray in the sort of the, the headlands area or potentially in vineyards or in home uh, backyards, which is also a problem with lanternfly. It'll get going in neighborhoods and things like that um, where uh, it's a little harder to, to get at. Um, okay, so that's, I guess my message here is we're kind of looking down the road where insecticides might be useful and necessary to manage this invasive pest. We're not quite there yet, and I don't think there's reason to panic, but I think there is reason to do is to be watchful for spotted lanternfly, the adults, their egg masses in your vineyards or around your vineyards, um, and so I guess I'm just going to uh, remind everyone, I think you've probably been reminded many times uh, at this point, to kind of keep your eyes open and report uh, any sightings um, through the kind of the, the Ag and Markets uh, website, or um, I, I assume Pennsylvania has something similar uh, to reports findings outside their normal dist or their current distribution. Because in, in New York, they'll at least initially try to do eradication programs. They'll come out and search the area see how wide that infestation is and potentially start removing uh, trees habitat for these guys or injecting trees for insecticides, that kind of stuff. Okay, next slide. All right, uh, we'll stop here and just see again if there's any questions. I guess I can look in the chat room. Here we go. I can at least do that. Ah, please feel free to ask questions. Thanks, Jim. All right, um, having not seen any questions, um, Let's uh, talk about great berry moth. Uh, anybody uh, at this stage want to just volunteer how things have been going with great berry moth, good or bad, in the last year or two? Any, uh, anybody want to sort of speak up and say oh, what, what issues you're having that I can kind of try to think about or target as I'm going through the biology? Please unmute yourself and ask a question if you do have one for him. Or I'll be interested in comments too. All right, quiet. Well, we'll see where we get with this. Um, how about, well, I'll ask this later. Let me, let me go through a little bit of review. So I think most people are pretty familiar with the biology of a great berry moth and some of the management techniques, but I'm gonna kind of go through this maybe pretty quickly. It'd be a bit of a review, but uh, I think, uh, might be useful um, if there's new growers uh, uh, th this may be new to you and so that I think that might be useful as well um, and certainly we're seeing some late season problems as I mentioned before that um, having a, a thinking about the biology will help maybe explain where where we're seeing these late season problems okay next slide okay so berry moth is a pest of eastern United States um, goes almost all the way over to the Rocky Mountains. For some reason, they don't seem to get over the Rocky Mountains. It always surprised me they don't make it. I think possibly some of them do, but the climate's just so harsh uh, in the West in terms of how dry it is and things like this until you get to the upper north Northwest um, that I just don't think they are successful there. But they are uh, widespread on the Eastern part down actually into uh, Texas, 
a uh, little bit into Florida and up north into, into the, the southern parts of Canada and it's a big problem in Ontario, a little bit into Quebec. Uh, so it's one of our native species um, that is pretty much a great specialist. Obviously, it utilizes, we have a number of species of wild grapes uh, in, in North America and they will utilize that fruit um, but have moved over very successfully and for a long time onto cultivated grape. Next. Okay, just a few pictures. Um, upper right are the, the blister-like eggs. They lay on young to older fruit. And I'll talk about their phenology in a second. Um, bottom right is a, a, a large picture of an adult. And in this case, it looks quite, I think, quite handsome. It's a handsome moth, but you know, when it's, you see it, it's actually quite tiny, you know, half an inch less than that uh, in size. It looks pretty drab in that sense. Upper left, uh, well, upper left is the pupil stage of the, of the insect, and bottom left is a larger instar of the larvae. So they go through five instars, they hatch as an egg, go through five larval instars as they get bigger and bigger, and then they pupate. Okay, next. So as you, I'm sure very aware, the impact of berry moth is uh, significant. One of the big ones for juice grapes is contamination at the processing plant, where technically um, we can only have about 1%. And um, uh, we've estimated that a 2% infestation rate at harvest kind of equals a 1% uh, contamination level. And then we have some information on thresholds in terms of contamination. They also can reduce yield. Um, obviously, the larvae are feeding on it. It's maybe not as big an effect, but it's not insignificant uh, for juice grapes than getting a load rejected because of contamination. That's obviously the, the, the biggest concern. Um, there are also sites for disease, particularly different kinds of bunch rots, uh, uh, botrytis, for example, where the berry moth, especially in tightly, more tightly cluster, tightly packed clusters, damages one or two berries as it maybe moves between the two berries, but that creates a wound and things like botrytis kind of uh, are, are necrophilia, uh, kind of uh, necrotrophic, I think is the term though for a plant pathologist, they feed on dying and dead tissue. And so if that grape is, is damaged, it's ripe and it's damaged, then botrytis really flourishes. So especially for the wine grape growers, this is a, a major issue for those cultivars of grapes that are tight, have tight clusters. This is where botrytis, maybe berry moth is much more of a worry because of botrytis than other aspects. Next slide, please. Okay, here's the, the phenology of, or the life cycle of grape berry moth. Um, so uh, it is a, what we call multi-generational pest. Uh, so it's multi-voltine going through several you know, bouts of egg laying during the season. They overwinter as that pupil stage. So, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a second. So that, that, that overwintering stage is kind of waits, probably in the leaf litter, uh, maybe along the edges of woods. And then it comes out in eh, about now actually uh, as an adult, they mate, Males typically come out before females, but then they mate. And this is probably a fairly extended time period. Um, and the mated females then start laying eggs. They often lay those eggs on the edges of vineyards or even in the woods. And over time though, they start moving into the vineyards. So they have at least what we call three sort of flights and, and generations of egg laying during the season. One that occurs around bloom time, a second one that occurs in kind of midsummer another one sort of towards the end of summer and possibly in warm years, which we're having more of, even a fourth generation um, and further south, they might even get a fifth generation in uh, of, of egg laying. So this is quite different than 50 years ago when a lot of the research was done on great berry moth where two generations is more typical, sometimes a partial third. Now three generations is pretty common and sometimes a partial or full, full fourth generation. Okay, obviously the larvae is the, the damaging stage. Um, 
and they can cause damage to some extent we think uh, in that first generation we don't think that's major significance because they're getting in the very young clusters uh, even possibly the flower clusters or young clusters they're not inside berries they do a little bit of webbing um, it's unclear that they cause disease from this we're not sure 100 percent, but it's unclear it's really those later generations that are probably causing the most damage and they're most concerned next uh, um, great berry moth, we have a pretty well-developed monitoring. I think you're pretty well that, aware of that for assessing the, how much uh, infestation is occurring in vineyards. It's based on this idea that we see both, well, we see a higher level of damage on the edges of vineyards, especially near woods, but we can also get it in the interior. So this, this sampling protocol, so I think you're all pretty aware, is based on assessing clusters for infestation on the edge and in the interior and kind of looking at what percentage of infestation is occurring. And we recommend doing this at a couple times during the season, depending on how high a risk your vineyard is. And so high, high value grapes are considered high risk, but also uh, yeah, vi Concord vineyards and other juice grapes that are growing in areas where they have a history of berry moth damage or have a lot of woods surrounding them, those are also considered high risk where um, you would want to be sampling uh, for damage and or just treating for it, depending on how high risk it is. Next slide, please. The threshold for juice grapes is based on this idea of contamination I mentioned earlier. This is work done by my predecessor and his grad students. And the basic upshot of this is if you want to get your fruit to the, the processor with uh, below 1% insect parts, um, having an average of less than 6% cluster damage in July and less than 15% in August um, should get you into underneath that kind of rejection point. But if you're kind of over that, then that requires some uh, intervention. For wine grapes, we actually don't have the thresholds worked out that well, given these kind of variation and susceptibility to disease, et cetera. But I would say in general, wine grape growers are using at least are this kind of 6%, 15% uh, estimate, but probably lower, probably in half that would be considered uh, a threshold. Next slide. Okay. Um, I'm gonna look at the chat box really quick here. Okay. No, like, no questions yet. Okay, I just an observation. I see one observation to, uh, All right, so we'll come back to that. Something about, uh, unfortunately, somebody got some freeze damage out there that's gonna change the phenology. Mm -hmm. And that, that might have some implications for um, berry moth. Um, and also there's some maybe implications for decisions about control. But let me, let me talk about phenology again in a little bit more detail. So if this phenology is sort of that life cycle, those different life cycle stages and how they progress during the season and what drives that progression. And the reason that's important is, especially regarding both actually monitoring, but also particularly with chemical uh, control, is that insecticides are targeting the very young larva that's just hatched out of the egg or the egg. Um, and we're trying to get at it, especially later season, before that larva has a chance to burrow inside the, the berry where they're no longer easily targeted with uh, insecticides. So uh, knowing when that occurs can give us some uh, kind of insights into when we might want to spray. So I've always get questions about don't the insecticides uh, kill some of the adults and I'm sure they do and I, we actually don't have that much actual data on this. The adults say pretty hidden. Um, I'm sure some of the insecticides, the more broad spectrum insecticides that act by contact like the pyrethroids, I, I'm sure they cause some mortality to adults, but we're really focused on trying to get these larvae before they start getting inside the fruit. We think that's where we get the most benefit. That's why timing is important and knowing when that egg laying stage is occurring kind of drives a lot of our uh, timing decisions for great berry moth. Next slide, please. What determines when that egg laying is gonna occur? Um, remember, we mentioned there's several generations of egg laying. How do we uh, understand that? And the basic uh, thing is that 
development and phenology is driven by temperature in insects as well as plants, um, other things that don't thermoregulate like uh, mammals do. So they have temperature driven development. So we use this concept of degree days, which I think everybody's pretty familiar with, is sort of the amount of temperature it sort of takes above some minimum developmental threshold to kind of progress through their development. So to go from an egg to egg hatch, how much heat does it take? Um, how much warmth to go through that stage, the next stage until they become adults legging? And that's somewhat or fairly predictable. And that's whose work it was done really by my colleague, uh, Mike Saunders at Penn State, um, predecessor for Flor Acevedo and his students that really worked this out. Um, so this is just how many degree days does it take to above that developmental threshold to kind of go through an egg lane to an egg lane female. Um, just an example of a degree day there, we can estimate it. There's more sophisticated ways to do that by taking the average temperature during the day. Uh, so tracking from that, the lower developmental threshold to give you how many kind of degrees accumulated during that day. So for example, if the max is 82 degrees, the min 60, Take the average of that, subtract 47.1, and you get about 24 degree days. Okay, well, what do we do with that? Next slide. Through the work that Mike and his, and his team did, we know that that developmental threshold, lower developmental threshold is about 47 degrees Fahrenheit, and that it takes about 810 degree days, like I just showed you calculated, to go from that egg to an egg laying adult resulting in, depending on temperature, two to three to four generations during the season. It's also dependent on when they go into diapause, however. And this is sometimes hard to, to, to understand. It's not just temperature uh, above the developmental threshold. It also relates to what triggers diapause. So next slide. Diapause is this overwintering stage that I mentioned before. So it is kind of defined by entomologists as the delayed development, so non-reproduction, that is not the direct result of prevailing environmental conditions. So we know if it's cooler, they slow down their development, it's warmer, they speed up the development. Diapause is different. It's sort of not triggered by cool or hot temperatures in this species in particular. Instead, the insect or evolution has developed an ability to recognize cues that tells it that, oh, winter's coming, and I need to prepare for that. And in this case, day length and the shortening day length is the cue that great berry moth and a lot of other insects actually use to prepare itself for going into that pupil stage and staying in that pupil stage until the springtime. Um, and it, and it, you know, might think, well, it's probably that last instar larva or the pupa that's the sensitive stage to shortening day length. And that's true in some insects, but in great berry moth, it's actually the egg stage or the very young larva. And this is based on work actually both, you know, done by uh, um, Mike's group as well as here at Cornell. Um, it's the egg stage. So if the day's getting shorter, the egg has an ability to perceive that day length. It's got a, a and this is very common in all sorts of organisms, this ability to kind of keep track of photo period. Um, if that gets below about 14 and a half hours day length, it says, ah, go through your development. You know, you're going to become first, second, third, fourth, fifth instar. But when you hit the pupil stage, stop and wait for other kinds of cues to let, uh, to, to decide when you're going to start developing again and going in to, you know, become an adult. So next slide, please. So just a little data here. Uh, this is the uh, work out of Mike's uh, Saunders lab kind of demonstrating that the day length in the population they worked with was, you know, if the, the hours are shorter than about 14 half uh, hours day length, they start going to diapause. So you look at this table at 14 hours, 92% of the population they were working with went into diapause, waited till the next spring in essence. Um, after, at about 14 and a half hours, which is around August, uh, they, uh, you know, a uh, certain percentage didn't go into diapause. At 15 hours, nobody went into diapause. Okay, so that's an important piece of information. So um, early August, if you're an egg laid at say August 1st, 
you're likely to not go into diapause. If you're an egg that's laid on August 10th, you'll go through your development, but your chance of going into diapause increases. So that when you pupate, let's say it's early September, or you, you form a pupa in early September, you're just gonna sit there and wait till you get enough chilling basically before you start developing again in the spring. Okay, next slide. So the reason I went through all this is to bring you to the temperature driven phenology model that's available on, on NUA that uh, we kind of developed. Uh, we, this is, you know, uh, Tim Weigel, uh, Mike Saunders group, uh, Rufus Isaacs group at Michigan State, uh, and our group here at Cornell helped develop a better an understanding of how temperature drives the phenology of Great Barrier Moth and use that to provide information, a forecast model for uh, growers to help them time their treatments if they need to treat for Great Barrier Moth. Okay, pause here and any questions? and or clarifications or comments. Yeah, please feel free to unmute yourself if you have one. You don't need to wait to the end. Okay, Greg, this might be a good time to answer my question about the frosted grapes. Uh, because I'm running behind on it, obviously the grape berry moth is not running behind because it didn't get frozen. So using yes. my time from, in fact, my, wild grapes have not even come into bloom as of Monday. So using my timing as opposed to my neighboring timings or the nearest site, probably the nearest site would be more accurate than using my own time from my own wild grape bloom. Uh, you, why, yeah, that's a good question. So why, the, you're bear, right, the berry moth is following is it, yeah it doesn't care apparently about frost it's pretty well frost protected so it's going to do its thing so it's going to be time now we do know that the population kind of gets spread out that takes a while for them to emerge uh in in the spring and then the generations kind of go from there um but there'll be time to that kind of wild grape they're still kind of evolved to kind of match that wild grape now i will say and i don't know how much pressure you're under whether you typically would put like a 10-day post bloom spray on um for berry moth, but let's say you do. Let's say you have a high pressure, high risk area and you want to target that first generation, which we don't think is often necessary, but let's suppose it is. What, what will probably happen if you, if, if your vineyard through these secondaries blooms a little bit later, and I don't know if you're talking about Concord or a hybrid here. No, this, so is Niagara, a Concord, right? this is a Concord vineyard. Okay, Concord, so Concord, so you might be off by a, a, a week or maybe more. You'll be more similar to vinifera, but what we did a little bit of research and if berry moth females are still out and about, you might get a little less egg laying on that first generation, but they'll still time, well, let me back up. We did this experiment where we asked, will berry moth lie on, lay eggs on a flower versus young fruit? And we actually used our colony berry moth and put them on clusters that were at either stage. And they didn't really like laying eggs. They'll do it. And I'm sure Ted Taft will tell you, he's found it. But they didn't really like laying eggs on the flowers. They kind of wanted to wait till there was a little berry there. So my guess is if they're females out and about when your plants bloom, and there probably will be, you'll get some eggs, but it'll be at the tail end of egg laying. Later on though, you know, that that generation kind of gets spread out. And so at mid season, you know, there'll probably be some egg laying going on when those fruit are, and they'll be susceptible and, and clearly and later in the season. So I would follow the model or your neighbor's bloom uh, rather than kind of yours to help you make your decisions. I think you'll, again, I don't know how, how risk, high risk you are at your site in hit, at, over historical times, but uh, that's probably still gonna drive when berry moth is hitting you. Does that make, make more or less sense? Yeah, it does. That's basically what I was figuring it probably would be. So, yeah. yeah. I thought what you're going to say, and I'm glad that's not the case. You are going to get a crop on that. And sometimes we'll get, yeah, we're probably going to be somewhere between a third and a half. Ouch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Greg, I had another question come into the chat box. Okay. And it says, do you think with having more and more early springs and late falls, 
that we might have to add an early spray about the time we do our Femopsis spray. That would be before bloom, right? When, when is the timing for Femopsis? That's that's a little ambiguous. Um, so it would start at the three inch and then go to the immediate pre-bloom. So it's in the shoot stage, yeah? Yes. Um, yep. Berry moth, I don't think, well, I guess I shouldn't make this absolute, but I'm not sure what berry moth would be doing then. I'm not sure they'd really be in the vineyard then if there's no kind of flowers and fruit for them. They, you know, that's going to be a problem for berry moth. That would be interesting in itself. If they come out, I mean, my guess wild grape will also be coming out earlier and earlier, but, and so they might be laying eggs on wild grapes, but I don't think you're going to get much adding an insecticide for berry moth at that stage. I mean, they're really, I think you're going to want to wait till you got fruit out there. I think Greg, what the question gets to in this, I'm, I had a question myself, um, was that economic threshold, do we need to adjust that when we're thinking there's going to be an extra generation? Um, the one thing we saw with Jody Timer, she did a study, I think it was 2010 through 2013 on late season Niagara harvest. So the confounding factor there is she was just looking at Niagara, but in every year there was a so-called extra generation and the incidence of damage applying IPM strategies at harvest, the incidence of damage always exceeded 2%. Yeah. So she was using those thresholds and still not meeting, um, you know, the incidents you, you would think she was meeting. I, I see. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, I think, I think that's probably right that we probably, those thresholds um, can't be used to put the sprayer away like we may be used to do if you went and monitored in August and maybe you're below 15%, that would be a lot, you know, actually. Um, that's a, yeah, that is a, actually a very good point. Um, we don't know if that connection, how good that is anymore. And honestly, that's why we're saying more and more, uh, you get to that stage, and I'll talk about this a little bit later. You, if you've got, you know, a history of this and risk, you're going to have to actually keep keep spraying for berry moth to avoid that situation where we're getting egg laying in September and infestations into September. Uh, I, I, yeah, we're seeing this more and more and I don't know the full explanation for this. And I think this is, needs more work, more research. And I know uh, people get tired of us and them all just keep asking for funding for great berry moth research because uh, we've been looking at it for years, but uh, things are changing and we don't have a full handle on that. And I, I do think, uh, I was going to say I had a vinifera vineyard here in the Finger Lakes where I was getting young larvae in the end of September. And, and they, they had huge amounts of damage in there. And they uh, had kind of stopped looking at it until they thought, started thinking more about harvest and were very, very disappointed. So I, I'm sure that's the same thing you're describing here. I, I, right now, I think in these warm years, one, we need to probably relook at that threshold decision process and add another sampling, probably, is my, my thinking. Uh, and then also probably uh, have to go into more of a calendar-based spray for higher risk areas, which we now recommend in the, in the phenology model on NUA, uh, where you're, you're continuing to go after them. And I'll explain in a second, but we know that the, the they become very asynchronous in their emergence by the end of the season. So just about any time, even when, despite what the model predicts, you can have egg laying going on late season. Again, probably by mid-September, they, they, everything tells us they should be shutting down, but you know, you're know you probably done harvest by then in, in Concords anyhow. Or we would hope so. I don't know, is that, I don't know if that gets at it, but I think that what, you're, you're suggesting is that maybe we do need to kind of revisit that old work by Hawthorne on the thresholds and sort of ask, are they still holding up? And if not, can we add a sampling period or change that? Threshold? Yeah, I think, I think my question is, to, you know, if, if it's 1986 or we had weather like it is 1986, it, I, I'm not 
necessarily questioning it, but if there is that extra generation, does that make a difference? Is that what was going on with those Niagara's or was it something different because they're Niagara's? So you, you know, a lot of what I saw when I was helping with that project was um, yield loss related to rot, which you might not see as significant in Concord because you know, some of it was probably downy mildew and things like that, but it was all caused by damaged berries or primarily driven by damaged berries. So in addition to that high incidence, which, you know, you can actually probably hide in Concord and it doesn't always get noticed at the plant. Um, it does get noticed in Niagara and that it seemed like there was more, I don't know if there was more because I haven't done it with Concord, but there was enough yield loss because of that rot so that it just made sense to spray more. So then the question is, you know, when do you spray? Do we need to, you know, I think Andy's worked a lot with bracketing sprays in that second generation. And is that, you know, does that pay more than trying to spray a lot late season or do you have to do both or, you know, and that's where I think that open research question is, is yeah. so we, we think we have a problem, but what do we, what do we do about it? And I, and I, and I don't know if that was in Pennsylvania or New York, but with Intrepid, you know, that can help you with that mm -hmm. middle and maybe depending on when you're going to harvest. Now Niagara tends to get harvest earlier, right? So that, uh, that might, cause it has a 21 day uh, to harvest restriction, but we, we can come back and talk about that, how to get better coverage for this late season issue. The other thing I was going to mention too, Kevin, I don't know what year that was, but in some years, one of the things we're seeing more of is warm nights in late, later season. Okay. Um, this has been a big issue for sour rot in wine grapes. I, I don't know if Niagara will get sour rot per se, but it gets bunch rots and things like that. Um, and these warm nights can just go crazy. So if you've got damage and then you've got microbes in there and you've got warm nights and just more heat there in that time. And if you're getting later season uh, egg laying and damage, then I think that they're kind of coming together. Yeah, Brian's not here today. Andy might remember, but I believe they did add so it was a three-year study. I believe they added a Botrytis application uh, in the Niagara to control that mm -hmm. those secondary rots like sour rots. But I don't think um, the, the the Botry or what, whatever they spray for Botrytis wouldn't help sour rot. But I don't know if the Niagara was getting sour rot. But Andy, do you remember what kind of rot it was? It was. I think it was Botrytis. Okay. If that's what they yeah, and they were adding a um, spray for Botrytis. Okay. So and I, I don't think at least what I've seen um, that that dam, which was any more in the Niagara. I just think again, because, you know, they're, they're white grapes, you can see the browning of the berries. Um, I just think, I think you mentioned this, Kevin, that it, it's a lot more visible in the Niagara's. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, when you get that mass of purple, <laughs> when they harvest, you know, it's tough, tougher to pick up. At the, at the processor. So I don't think that there's a, a varietal preference, at least in between the Niagara and, um, or enough of a, a varietal preference to really show a difference. Now, I, I guess there is some uh, research and, and Greg, you know, uh, either <laughs> differ with me on this or not, but I have heard at least anecdotally that there are preferences um, with the berry moth with some varieties. Um, I've had growers that have had uh, some hybrids that were planted next to the Concords and the Concords really weren't as affected as some of the hybrids. So there may be a preference situation, but I don't think, you know, with the Niagara and Concord, to me, I don't think there is. I just think that that late season, I think like Greg said, when we get to those later season and they're still egg laying that is especially if we reach that 1620 before august 5th um growers will follow up to that 1620 spray but then when we suggest you know sort of not looking at the model anymore and just continuing on a spray basis i think very few if any growers continue um with those extra sprays late in the season. And I think that, I think that's a big part of it. Plus the fact that, um, you know, they don't want to put that extra spray on because, you know, it's, it's more money. Sure. And then the fact that, I don't know, they're, they're, 
they're just so used to not going past that and putting those extra sprays on. Uh, and then the coverage. I think the coverage is used in Concord. It's a really huge issue. So I, I don't know how we get around it, Greg, unless, like you said, they follow that continual spray program later in the season um, to try and reduce. Say uh, for August 6th or 7th, uh, you might be should have put on a spray a couple weeks later and a couple weeks later after that. Okay, um, let me go on my next slide here. And we, maybe we can have some more discussion on this. This is a kind of evolving kind of recommendations that we went, I wanna talk about. So this is just some basic information on uh, the, the, how the, the new model forecast is working for Barry Moth. I point out that 810, that second flight 1620, we think are pretty useful, but, um, and, and to use 18, 810 or 1620 for, things that act as uh, more ingestive, like Alticor, Delegate, Intrepid. Next slide. For those insecticides that act more in contact, like the pyrethroids or gamophosphates, uh, you can use a, extend that out a little bit, and maybe put it on a little bit later and get some benefit. Um, also a note, if you're using one of the organic products like BT, um, you want to be spraying that twice per generation in those first two generations and then you're kind of you're relying on that and this is tough because you really need good coverage but uh, you're going to have to spray multiple times going forward after 1620. As, as Andy mentioned and as I'm sure you're all aware getting coverage on the berries especially for some of these products that are getting that that young larva or even egg um, is, is quite important. So using the kind of, uh, you know, the best you can with uh, how you're orienting the nozzles, how you're, you know, the amount of uh, uh, um, agitation, air, air that you're putting into the sprays. We need uh, Andrew Landers here to give us all the advice on getting good coverage, but uh, that's important there. Okay. Uh, the other point here is like maybe um, uh, after mid-September, we probably can ease off but between that eight, at 1620 and uh that mid-september period where we're getting a lot of this late season damage i think uh in many of these years these warm years that we're seeing pretty commonly now you're probably going to have to go to a more of a 10 to 14 day uh interval uh to um, maintain damage below that kind of threshold next slide for me Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit. I'd, I'd just be happy just zeroing in on this. I don't need to go through the rest of my talk. Uh, so why are we seeing this late season damage? And it seems to be worse. Um, where 30 years ago, you could put the sprayer away um, after mid-August and you probably, third week of August, and you're probably good shape um, in terms of damage. And now we're getting surprises as we get closer to harvest. Um, Part of the reasons, as I mentioned, is that the berry moss not that very synchronized. It is fairly, it's even, even the first flight's not that well synchronized and it gets less and less synchronized as you know, larvae develop at a little bit different rates or in different microclimates. Um, so they kind of spread out. So by that second, especially at third, that third flight, at the time we get pink egg laying, there's some adults that are already passed and they've laid their eggs and there's some adult, some pupae that haven't come out yet. So it kind of spreads things out a bit. Another possibility, we haven't done the research on diapause for a number of years. This was work done in the early 20, uh, 2000s uh, that Mike Saunders group did. And they only used one or two populations of berry moth. So is our estimate of diapause occurring after day length of 14, 14 hours that early August period, how accurate is that? What's the, what's the distribution around that? Is it changing? You know, uh, because we know further south, berry moths present and they're probably going to diapause later. So we know they have the genetic capacity to adjust into to conditions. And I would not be surprised if that's not going on. The other important factor is if there's a really high population, even if you got the timing pretty good, there's a certain number that are gonna survive um, or there's a certain number that are just a little out, out of sync, 
a little further ahead or further behind. So you're going to miss those. And if there's a lot of them, um, now we're getting something noticeable late in the season. Um, and finally, maybe we have some questions about insecticide efficacy, which could be primarily due to coverage. Uh, we could be having some resistance issues uh, developing. I've not seen publication or research done on it, but I know carbaryl seems not to be working as well as it used to in Michigan and maybe the Lake Erie region. And I'd be interested in people's comments on that. That used to be a stand, one of our standby materials. Uh, could be um, really coverage, maybe the, 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 the more important thing um, that could contribute to higher populations. Okay, so that's kind of my current thinking on why late season damage seems to be increasing and that why we're gonna need to adjust our sprays as we were talking about before when Kevin and, and, and also one of the growers asked about you know, what, what can we do in terms of changing thresholds, et cetera. I do think going into these high risk areas, going into a more continual coverage late season is probably be important. And maybe, you know, looking at things that have really good residual, if you can get the coverage, if we can put on, uh, and again, I haven't tested this, but typically we talk about Intrepid, which we know has really good residual as a really good second flight material and sp spreads that uh, coverage out. And I know in Pennsylvania, they have more, actually more experience than we do in New York in using it. it in New York, anyhow, it's got a, a label change where if you use the lower rate, you can use it up to 21 days before harvest. So can you get a third spray of Intrepid or a, an Intrepid spray later in the season um, that can give you some better coverage? I, I'd like to see that uh, examined a bit more. Um, Alticor also has pretty good um, coverage. And I think it's, what is Alticor? I think it's seven days, uh, seven days to harvest. So you have a little better, uh, spread on that as well, but or a little, little better, you can get that closer to harvest. So you can use that later season, although it's expensive. Um, okay, so that's kind of what I wanted to say about uh, late season very much damage. Uh, you got a, a next slide, just a curious what I have next. I think it's on, this, on different management options. And we've kind of been talking about those. Um, let's see, why don't you, could you slip through just to get to the chemical control? I think it's maybe even the next slide, there we go. All right, let me stop for a second and see what time it is. Uh, 1126. Okay. Um, questions, comments, uh, suggestions for things that I should look at or, or the research community should be looking at. Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask those questions. Would you like me to stop sharing? Um, yeah, I think so. Let's, that'd be fine. All right. Can you hear me? A large image of my bald head. This is Jim Bartlett. Can you hear me? Yes, Jim. Hey, I got a question about carbaryl. Uh, I haven't used it in 20 years. Uh, do you think that maybe after that time period that it might be useful again? And if it is, where would you put it in your spray schedule? Uh, as uh, early, middle, or late? So that the first part of that question is on, you know, if you have some resistance levels, and I guess there was some at least anecdotal evidence that was occurring, if you stop using it, and that's, let's say every, a lot of people stop using it. I think that's actually the case, that it really we haven't been using a lot for anything. I, maybe, correct me if wrong, I don't think people are using it maybe for potato leaf hopper or something like that, but I think we've switched over to pyrethroids for our broad spectrum materials. So it depends on the type of resistance in some types of resistance, in fact, you, it will slide back and be susceptible and you'll get uh, some efficacy there. There's other kinds of resistance where they don't tend to see that. And I just don't know the answer for carbaryl. It, it might be, uh, efficacy might go up uh, um, after this kind of uh, delay, but I, I'm not, I guess I can't answer that without knowing more about the mechanisms and kind of even looking at it. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me if you get a bit more um, but these populations, you know, as long as it's, if the resistance genes are in the populations, if you hit them a couple of times, they'll come back pretty quickly. And that's always a concern. I think you see that in fun, some of the fungicide resistance too. It's not all that. Uh, once you got it, it's kind of hard to go back to your SIs or whatever. Um, where I might try using it, we've used it in that later season uh, rotation because of that seven, I think it's seven days, seven days to harvest. 
Yeah, I think that's right. Again, I haven't been using it a while, so I forget these things. Yeah, it's seven days, uh, seven days to harvest. Um, so we've put it in there, but I think, um, and I, again, if you're a high risk area um, and you, you kind of go with that 10 day post bloom or that kind of first generation flight, I think you could, you, it's inexpensive. You, if you could get some benefit there, it probably wouldn't hit, hit down the leaf hoppers at the same time. Is it doing anything different than pyrethroids at that time? Not, not right, probably, but that would be, I, I think either later season or maybe that mid season, I would like to see people using that intrepid or some combination of those longer residuals uh, to try to, as, as that generation spreads out, you're gonna get better, better, hopefully residual control with that one of those materials. There's um, probably some room to rotate delegate, which I don't know if that's as good as an intrepid from an efficacy standpoint, but um, I yeah. think, yeah. I mean, intrepid changed the game for New York for sure. I think growers using it are much happier than they were three years ago when they didn't have that tool. Yeah, that's really interesting. I don't know if delegate has as long a residual, but it was a, it's a good material in terms of berry moth, uh, more selective uh, than, well, not more selective than Trepid, actually. Trepid is a growth regulator. It's quite selective to Lepidoptera, but it delegates more selective than some of the pyrethroids um, where, so I think it is a good rotational material. I think it, uh, I wish they'd bring the price down a little bit but, uh, I so that we can do more rotations and do it economically. Well, it looks like it's right around $20 an acre. I just looked it up. Well, you so. did. That's come down actually. Okay. Uh, um, that's come down. Verdeprin is actually harder to find a price for because it's not really used in the area, but I think it's closer to 50 from what I've been Ooh. able to source. So, wow. Um, and Altacore prices have gone up in the last few years, but it's still going to be cheaper to use Altacore. But Delegate, I, you know, I don't, I, if somebody wants to unmute and say they've used it around here, I haven't heard a lot of that being used. Uh, Andy probably used it when he was, you know, doing those, the bracketed spraying. But other than that, I don't know if it's been used commercially. Actually, I, I did not use Delegate um, uh, in those bracketed sprays. Um, I don't think anybody, I haven't heard anybody in our area using Delegate. So I, I would like to see, especially, you know, since that price has come down, like Greg said, you know, you know, the when it was more expensive, definitely guys wouldn't use it. But now I think that would be another good option for our guys um, uh, to use, to throw in there for, um, you know, resistance management also. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it was over $30, I think, when I, and this was a number of years ago when I priced it out. So it has come down, I think. Interesting. Andy, in that study where you did bracketed, by that you kind of did the timing and you bracketed on either side of the, the predicted uh, peak flight? Usually what we did, we, we shot for the 810, put it on at the 810 like an Intrepid or an Altacore. And then we, well, probably 10 days later, uh, seven to 10 days later, we put on a, a, another insecticide. Uh -huh. So, and, and I, I think it definitely helped, but Again, you know, with some of these real high population areas, even then we still had, you know, what a lot of people would consider, you know, more berry moth than they'd like to see. But it definitely helped the bracketing. And um, okay. later on in the season, again, like I mentioned, um, I don't think a few years ago at the um, winter conference, you know, we went through that and we had actually reached that 1620 before August 5th. And so the bad part is, depending on if you applied a seven or 10 day, um, you had to put on four to six sprays from that time period in that seven to 10 day, you know, uh, a window to keep, to keep applying. Um, you would have to uh, apply it, I think, four to six more sprays, which, you know, that's really tough for Concord growers to sort of swallow. Sure, of course. Wow. And that got, kind of takes you from, well, say 1610 was August 5th. Um, you, 
when when was harvest like uh september 10th or something like that so we're talking maybe 30 40 days yeah yes i wonder what whether you could get away with a like uh let's see what the timing be you do us it depends what you sprayed i guess that would be your second spray so you might put an intrepid on there could you go back to back intrepids i don't know how expensive the intrepid is and get a little better residual overall um yeah it's gonna be worth thinking through how to combine these things to uh, you know now if you're a vinifera grower or you know real high value maybe hybrid you know you you could more easily justify that but our concord guys yeah that's a rough that's rough to convince guys or even for the economics of it and kevin i'd have to you know maybe we could talk about this in the podcast or something um can you split that down the middle and get, and get enough of a benefit you know to uh get your crop uh, accepted and we're almost all your crop accepted but you know yeah you get a bit of damage but uh compared to getting very low damage but spraying four extra times that uh, well you know i could see especially if if you were going to put those extra sprays on if you have rows that were you know um parallel to the parallel. Wood, i could definitely see a guys you know maybe spraying eight ten rows in from the woods you know and not do your whole vineyard mm -hmm. but we've always had that issue with perpendicular to the woods <laughs> and yeah. you know that's always been a tough tough call how do you how do you do that cheaply yeah or uh, cost effectively yeah um, well in 50 years we all have remote uh, driven sprayers <laughs> that are <laughs> we're not quite there yet right terry i don't think terry's on here but <laughs> uh, it can kind of back up really easily and <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Greg. I would like to say that if anybody has thought of any questions that you would like to ask him, please feel free to email them to myself or Andy or Kevin, and we can make sure to get them off to him to have him answer them for us. I do realize you are pressed for time and I do not want to keep you from your next engagement. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're doing a job search for new faculty position for tree, or not, yeah, for tree fruit, apples particularly. So we're kind of right engaged in that. So that's exciting to get a new faculty member hired, uh, but that's what's going on for me today. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us. Thanks, Greg. I'm happy to do it. Thanks for the discussions, guys. Um, good luck with the growing season and uh, uh, keep me posted on how things are going. Do keep your eye out for, uh, open for a spotted lanternfly. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I imagine it's coming. Uh, whether it gets you before Andy and I retire, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Have right. a great day. Thank you for joining us. Take care, everyone. Bye now.